So today's session um, is on account administration specifically. And I'm also going to talk a bit about public processes here towards the end, but majority of what we're talk going to talk about today is account administration, which includes setting up users, um, what user rights mean, how to create the control panels. So in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a wheel icon. And it just looks like a, a circle. And it's all the way in the upper right here. If your go-to meeting um, control screen is in the way, then just shrink it down or drag it off to the side and then you'll see the wheel. If you don't see this wheel in the upper right-hand corner, it just means that you're not an administrator. And I know that we have all different types of um, people on the line here, um, but some of you probably aren't administrators, which means you can't access account administration. Although I still think it's useful um, for you to watch this or listen to this webinar because you can kind of understand more about um, what when you log in to your system and you've been given restricted rights, what that means. So all the way in the upper right-hand corner, if I click on this wheel icon, I'm going to see these three options. So first, I'm just going to go here to user accounts. So this is what account administration looks like. Sorry, I think you're seeing my screen now. The sharing button wasn't on. If people can't see my screen, let me know, but I'm just looking to see that it's active now. It looks like it is. So this is called the uh, account administration. And the first thing you see here is the user list, which are these people right here. At the top of the user list, you're always going to see what's called the key account holder. And that's me right here. I know this is the key account holder because there's a little yellow key here, which represents the key account holder. The key account holder will always be at the top of the list as well. All the users then flow in alphabetical order by last name. And you'll always see the username associated with that user listed right here next to the person's name. So the first thing I want to show you is how to create a user. So you go here to this button called New User. <laughs> I've reached my level of users and I need to upgrade. Well, I guess this is interesting to see as well. Um, if you do get this error message, it means that you've used all the users that um, that have come with your account. And if you click this icon or you go right up here to upgrade users, then you'll see um, the level of users that you have. So to increase your level of users, you just choose the box of the amount you want, and then you just hit update. So it's easy as that. You get 10 users with your basic subscription. So you'll always get this 10 user level with your basic subscription. If you want to increase from there, um, I wouldn't pay attention to this these dollar amounts. It's basically like five bucks per user per month. Um, give us a call or send us an email through the help desk and say you want to upgrade your users and ask for a deal. Oftentimes, we'll give you even 20 for free. Um, and then from there, we'll give you discounts as well. And the reason we do that is the more people, more employees you have using Touchstone, the more valuable it's going to be for you. Therefore, the longer you're going to keep your account and the more use you're going to get from it. So having your employees log in, go to their dashboards, train them with those processes, um, have them access them for reference, innovate them. The more of that that happens, the more valuable all of it's going to be for you in the end. So let's go new user now again. So the first question I have here is what type of user? And there are two types. There's user and admin administrator. An administrator has access to everything in Touchstone, including being able to come here to account administration and edit and change people's user rights. In addition, they can delete things. They can So make sure whoever you make an administrator is actually a trusted uh, employee. You want to um, make people administrators who are like the Touchstone power user. They're either the owner of the company or the person who's in charge of making sure that Touchstone is being implemented and used. It's always a good idea to have a person like that in your business, whether it's you as the owner or a high-level employee. 
Um, office manager is generally, um, for bigger companies, the person that I see who is accountable for making sure that Touchstone is being used. There should be an overall person who monitors um, people's use of the system and also um, pushes forward the documentation. So admin user or user. If you make someone a user, that means you can restrict their access. So you then would type in the username. This should be um, an email address or a valid email address. Obviously, this one is not, but it should be because if the person forgets their password, they can go to the touch and login screen and recover it. If this is not a valid email address, then the password recovery won't go anywhere. Then you give the, uh, the user a password. You have to type it twice to make sure you did it right. And then this is the first and the last name. These are the only um, two required fields. You can fill in all this information if you want to, but it's not required. And then I just hit Create User. And you can see I've done this twice. So the user will appear um, in alphabetical order by last name. Once you've added a user, the next step you want to take is to um, create their access to Touchstone. So that happens over here um, with this button that's called User Access. So when you give an employee access to Touchstone, you're giving them access to the positions that they position or positions that they fill on the organization chart. So that's how Touchstone establishes access. So you give this user access to a box on the org chart, a role, and then that gives them access to all the processes that are on that job description. So if we go back here to the organization chart, I'll show it to you another way. So if I was to give this user access to this position, bookkeeper, that then gives that person access to all these processes on this job description. If I give them read access, it means all they can do is read what's here. They can read the job description. They could click on any process, and they can go to the process tools page, and they can just read what's here. They can't edit or change anything. They just can see it. If you give someone edit access, that means they can edit what's here. So they can't add anything new here. They can't add any more processes. When they go to a process, they can't add any work plans or checklists. All they can do is edit what's already there. And then create access, which is the highest level of access aside from being an administrator. That means that person can go in and add new things to this job description. So they can go here and add new processes. They can remove processes here. And they can go to the processes on the job description and they can change them. They can upload new files. They can add more work plans. So let's go back here to account administration and then back to this user. So here, when I go to user access, I'm seeing the same org chart. You'll see your org chart here. It just looks, it's in outline view rather than tree view. So I think about this user and I ask myself, what positions does this person need to have access to? So the number one way to ask, answer that is what position do they fill on the org chart? What role do they fill? So if they're the bookkeeper, I'd choose bookkeeper. Then I'd have to ask myself, what level of access do they need to this position? Are they just going to read what's there? Do I want them to be able to edit and change what's there? Or do I want them to be able to create new things? So the way to answer this is if this person is going to help you to document the processes on their job description, then they need create access. If they're not going to help document the processes on the job description, all they need to do is access them for training, use them, then it's read access. I think edit access is kind of not used a ton. Um, so when you're deciding this, just keep it simple for yourself. Do they need to, do you want them to help you document the processes or do they just need to read what's there? So let's give this person read access to this position. So once you've assigned access, you'll see it with the color, which represents what type of access they have. Now you can give people access to multiple positions on the org chart. 
One reason you'd want to do that is if they actually fill more than one box on the chart. So if my bookkeeper here is also the receptionist, and because I've built a future chart, a picture of where the business is going, then, and in the current situation, this person actually fills both of these roles, then I would just choose that position, and then I'd give the level of access I want and hit update. Now when they log into Touchstone, they'll be able to access both of these positions. Another reason to give multiple access is if a person fills in for another person. So when the bookkeeper's um, on vacation, the receptionist fills in for that person. So if I was the uh, receptionist, I would need access to both of these roles because when this person's gone, I, I fill in for them. So any kind of cross training or one position filling in for another, that's another reason to give multiple access. Uh, let's go to another example here. So I just clicked Mike's name on the user list, and I'm going to go to user access again. So let's say Mike is a manager. Let's say he is the manager of admin and finance. If I choose this position and I give him access, and normally a manager would have create access. They would have create access because a manager's role is to help to document and develop processes. It's part of what being a manager is. If you're striving to have a process-dependent business, all of your managers need to know that it is their accountability to document and develop the processes that they use and that their employees use. So if I hit update here, you'll see because of that methodology, we've given not only uh, access to this role, the manager's role, but also the same level of access to the positions underneath. And Touchstone defaults to this because of this idea that managers should be developing and documenting the processes that their employees are accountable for using. It's part of their job as a manager to get results through other people. The best way to do that is to have um, documented processes that those employees follow and the manager is accountable for that. Now, if I wanted to, I could go in here and you know, change the level of access to the subordinate positions. You can do that. So now that's what that looks like. But you probably don't want to because the manager needs to, should have create access to those positions. So let's change, let's change this one to edit just so we have a representation of all different types of access. And now I'm going to log in here as Mike so you can see what this looks like. So we're logging in as Mike now. And if we go to the organization chart, this is what he would see. So all of this is grayed out because he does not have access to those positions. We didn't give him access to those positions. This whole department is illuminated because these are the positions we gave him access to. If I choose this position, this position we gave him um, create access to. So you can see up here, I could add processes to this job description. I could remove them. When I go to a process like this one, now I have create access to this process, so I could go to this work plan, I could click and open and edit this task. I can add a new work plan right here. So this is what create access looks like. The only thing I can't do as a create user is delete things. So you'll see up here, normally the, uh, the X icon is here. For administrators, it'll always be here, but for, um, create users, edit and read only, they can't delete things from Touchstone. So then let's go back here to the org chart and go to bookkeeper. So I think this is read only access. So you'll notice these toolbar items are gone up here. So I can't add new things to this job description. I can't edit or change the title. If I click on um, a process here. I can't edit or change this. If I go to the work plan, I can't, I'm clicking on this and it's not opening for me to edit. I can't add a work plan. So 
So this is what read only looks like. I can print right here. Uh, I think we did edit access for um, receptionist. So I can't add new things to this job description. I can only edit and change what's here. So no new processes can be added. And when I go to a process, I can't add new work plans. I'm clicking right here on the work plans. I can't add anything new, but I can go to existing work plans and I can add tasks and I can edit and change the information that's already here. So those are the three level of access and what it looks like. If we go to the four key functions here, when I click on any one of these functions, I can see these processes here, but everything's grayed out other than the processes that are on the job descriptions that I have access to. So that's what happens when someone clicks around the four key functions. We're having a new release soon. Um, it's gonna be in about a month or so, and you'll be getting emails and highlights about it. But the, in the new release, the four key functions, the interface is different, um, and the functionality is expanded. And for read-only users, they're not even gonna see the four key functions anymore because there's really no reason for a read-only user to be able to come and even look at the four key functions. So it's the, their uh, user interface when they log in is going to be simplified. They'll be able to see the org chart because I think that's useful for all employees and their dashboard, obviously, but this four key functions tab won't be there anymore. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to this main admin account that we just left. I think the best way to get a feel for what your employees or your um, people you manage will see when they log into Touchstone is to actually create their user access and then go log in as them and kind of see what they're seeing. Now I got a um, I got a message in the Help Center last week that I thought it was I thought it was interesting and relative to this conversation about account administration. So I thought I'd just mention it. The person thought that there was an issue with their Touchstone account because when they would go to their dashboard and they had assigned a um, employee a control panel for a position, they didn't see the management review, even though this employee was a, was a manager. And the reason there's no bug in Touchstone, the reason for that is no employees were assigned those positions that were underneath that manager. So I'll bring that up again um, after, as we talk about control panel assignment. So let's go here to this user that we just added. So once you've established uh, user access, then you want to go and create a control panel for this person, this new user you've added. So it's the same idea. Here's the organization chart. So here I'm going to assign this person a control panel that will appear on their dashboard. This has nothing to do with user access. So the dashboard is read-only. Nobody can edit or change or do anything in the dashboard other than view the documentation and use it. Like if there's a checklist in it or a form, use it for training, use it for um, ongoing uh, use of the process. So this is unrelated to user access. They're two separate things. User access is deciding what level of access do you want to give that person? Can they edit or change things uh, regarding their processes or not? When you give the control panel assignment, you want to think what position does this person fill? What's their job? So I would go and assign a control panel. And then Touchstone asks me, is this a managerial position or a staff position? If it manages other people, then it's a managerial position. If the position does not manage other people, then it's staff. This one would be staff. They're at the bottom of the org chart. There's no positions underneath them. So then I hit update. This is a managerial position. It's got positions underneath it. So that's how you create the control panel assignment. So when this person logs in, they're then going to see that control panel on their dashboard. Now, if back back to the user question that I got earlier this week, if they, if I'm the manager of admin finance 
and there's no people assigned to the positions underneath me, so nobody has a control panel for these three positions, then I won't see them in management review on the dashboard. They just won't be there because no, there's nobody's been assigned to them. So that's what the answer to this person's problem was. They needed to create users on the user list, add new user, and then assign them control panels for the positions underneath the managerial one. So if we go to the dashboard here, this is what I mean. Here's my managerial assignment. So I'm the manager of admin and finance. And then below me, I see these people in management review. If there was no one assigned to the bookkeeper role, well, then this position wouldn't even be here. And unless I knew why, and knew why I would think, oh, it's missing. Okay, let's go back here. So that's how you control, you set control panels. If we go to my name here and we click here on user access, now remember I'm an administrator, I'm the key account holder, I'm gonna get this error message. This just says you're an administrator and you have full access to everything. There's no reason to assign access. If I go here, you'll see my control panel assignment right here. If I were to remove this, so now there's, I'm logged in as me, there's no control panels assigned. If I go back here to the dashboard, you'll see this is what it looks like. So for any one of your users or yourself, if you log in as that person and you go here to the control panel and you see nothing, it's because you haven't assigned a control panel yet. So then let's go back here to user, and let's choose me again and then go to control panel, and now I'm going to assign a control panel. Manager, update. Okay, so easy as that. So one of the reasons why you want to assign these control panels is so that your employees can, when they log into Touchstone, they can access what they're accountable for. You can use it for new employee training, you can use it for ongoing training, you can you they can use those processes to just um, be able to remember how to do things. If there are forms or documents that need to be completed, they can go to their dashboards and complete those things. If they forgot how to do something, they can go to their dashboard and remind themselves of how to do it. If they're managers like this, they can go in and make sure that their employees are trained in their processes. Make sure that their employees are using their processes. So there is any number of reasons why it's important to get your employees logging into Touchstone. If the upgrading of users is getting in your way of that, call call us and we'll we'll figure it out for you. Having people at least know how to log in and at least be able to go to a control panel and see the processes they're accountable for is an extremely important step to take. Even if nobody is going to be completing checklists and forms inside of here, still having the ability for them to be able to view their processes is going to make your processes more successful. Managers can start to use techniques with their employees, like telling them, if you forgot how to do that or you can't find that form, go to Touchstone and, and look at it. It's all in Touchstone. It kind of gets employees to own it a little more, be accountable for it. If managers can take that one step further and not only say, if they forgot something, go to Touchstone and, and review it, they can then say, well, if it's not in Touchstone, let's put it in there. If there is no process for this, whatever we're talking about, let's go, let's build it. Let's go and build a process in Touchstone. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen or heard managers trying to teach their employees something and they're having them, you know, with sticky notes writing down what they're supposed to be learning or even on sheets of paper and then expect them to take that and like, you know, use it to learn how to do the process. The issue with that is that's kind of a haphazard way of teaching someone something but even more to the point, what happens the next time you have to do that same training? You're going to have another employee sitting down, and I'm going to go through it all over again and have them make their own notes. It's not a good way to do training. It's, um, uh, it's costing you money to train people that way. 
So when you say to yourself, well, we don't have time to sit down and develop a customer service process, or we don't have time to do this process or that process, we just have to do it. Think about all the money and time you're wasting by not having a training for that process, not having a consistent way of doing it. Use that as motivation to decide that you're going to sit down and touch down and spend a few hours actually documenting it. Another key reason to set up users and account administration and have them um, using their own dashboards is Touchstone saves the information unique to them. So Bob down here as receptionist, when he goes into Touchstone and logs in with his own username and password, and then he goes to the purchase order process and actually fills out a work order or a purchase order and saves it back to Touchstone, well, Touchstone knows that that's Bob who's done it, and he's the only one who can see that information, he and his manager. If you have people logging into Touchstone with the same username and password, so you have like sales at sales.com and everyone logs in as that, well, then you compromise the information on the dashboard because everybody is going in and, and using that form or document if they are, um, and they can change and view anything everyone else is doing. So the usernames and passwords provide security, and they also allow for managers to be able to see who's doing what. It also allows for a manager to track training information. So even if none of these people um, are using Touchstone to complete things on their dashboard, but they're um, using it for reference, but they're not actually using the dashboard functionality, the, it's still valuable for the manager to be able to see them individually here. So if I just hired Bill, if I go to him in management review, I can track his training of these different processes. I can go to processes I've trained him in and mark him as trained which puts these little checkmark icons next to his the processes. I can keep notes inside of these processes. When I'm doing uh, managerial work regarding Bill, like when I'm in my own control panel, I can go and complete performance evaluation forms or meeting forms um, and save them with his name on them. So it's it's also useful for managers to see their employees' names, and you only get that result by going here to um, account administration and setting them up as users. Um, so let's go over this toolbar item. This is called account settings. And when I click this icon, um, the first thing you see at the top here is the business name. Now mine's called training, and you can see it right here, training. But you should see your business name here. You can go in and edit and change the business name if it's wrong, and then whatever you change it to, um, it's up here in the upper left-hand corner of your touchdown screen. The header color down here is the color of this space all the way across the top of your touchdown account. So to change the header color, I just click this little box icon, and then I choose a new color, and then I just hit update down here at the bottom. Now you'll see it's this blue color. The text color is th this icon row up here. So I go to text color, and I choose a color, and then I hit update, same thing, then the text color changes. So if you haven't gone and customized your, in account settings, haven't customized the header of your account, definitely do that. It um it, it it makes it more familiar to your employees. Makes it feel like this is something they recognize. You can even upload your logo, which is this little button right here. So you just hit choose file, then you're searching your computer and you find your logo and you hit open and then you'll see it appear in this um, file chosen and then you just hit update and then your logo will appear in the upper left corner here. Make sure you go and click this flag that says display logo. If I don't have this checked, let me just hit update here, then you see my logo is still there. It's still been uploaded, but it's not in, I don't see it anymore. Same with display default colors. De the default colors are this green. 
So if you don't go and uncheck this box, then um, whatever colors you've chosen as your header or your text color won't appear. You'll just see the default colors. You can also undisplay the company name. Let me just display the logo again and undo the default colors. So this is where my logo is. If your logo contains your company name, sometimes you don't want the, it's just redundant. So if this said touchstone right here instead of training, I've already got it here, so I don't need it here. So if that's the case, just hit this uh, undisplay or display company name and hit update, and then that disappears. If you have a logo that's a certain color, like ours is white here, sometimes it's nice to go and have it blend. So I'm just choosing white as my header color, and then I hit update, and then you see it blends. One thing you don't want to blend is the text color and the header color. So you see up here, I can't see this text anymore because my text color and my header color are the same color. So there, if I just choose the header color and I choose another color and hit update, then it reappears up there. So go to account settings here and um, adjust them. Make them kind of fit your um, style, your logo, your look and feel. Uh, you can delete um, users from the user list too. So this is the delete user. I think I missed this. If I click delete user and then I hit the drop down here and I go to the user I want to delete. Then I just hit delete and it asks me if I, I'm sure. I say okay and then that user is gone. When you delete a user, you're also going to be deleting anything that they've completed in their dashboard. So what I mean is if I've gone in here and let's say I went to um, the one-on-one -on -one meeting managers and I had been completing this uh, form every time I did a meeting and saving those agendas back to Touchstone, and I've been doing that for years, if somebody goes and deletes me as a user, um, then all that saved information is deleted as well, everything unique to me. Not the process itself. The process is always there on the four functions unless I go and delete it from there. But here in the dashboard, anything that I've saved back to Touchstone or completed will be deleted if my user is deleted. So if that's the case and there are things that you want to save and you truly want to delete a user, then export that information just by clicking the print and then download it. It just creates a PDF that you can download. In this example, I don't know that one-on-one -on -one forms other than the current year are useful to go in and download, but there might be other things that you've saved um, as that, that employee has saved as they've been doing their work that you want to save yourself. So remember that about deleting users. Also remember if you're one person has left and another person has come on board, and I've actually seen people do this before, and you go to that user and instead of deleting them and adding a new user, you just edit their name here. Well, remember that whatever, let's go here, whatever Bob has done, say he's the employee who's leaving and I change this to Bill, whatever Bob did, if I'm just editing this current user, now when Bill logs in, he's going to be able to go and see all that saved information. So he's just logging into the same control panel. And there might be some situations where that where you like that, where you want to save all that old information. But do remember that that, that new person is going to be able to go back and see everything that Bill did if, if the name is just edited and not deleted and re-entered. Um, okay. There, in the Resource Center, for everyone who's interested, there are detailed step-by-steps for using the control panel, I mean, the uh, account administration. You just go to the search and type in whatever subject you want. In this example, account administration. Here's frequently asked questions. Here's a training on account administration. Um, what is account administration? Account settings. If you go click on a like what is this is in the user guides so if I go back to the user guide here which you can access from the home screen 
and then I scroll all the way down here to the bottom, this whole anything and everything about account administration is here. So one thing I really want to get across about account administration again is that putting your setting up users is just invaluable to um, the the results that you want to get from Touchstone. Having your employees use the processes is the number one thing that creates success. When people quit Touchstone, they're like, "I we we just haven't used it in six months and cancel their subscription." Almost a hundred percent of the time, it's because people aren't using it. So getting your employees to use it is is the benefit of it. If you don't require them to use it, just like you would require them to check their email or answer their phone or enter things into QuickBooks, those are requirements. This, um, the documentation and the use of procedures tends to feel like it's not a requirement because it's new for a lot of companies. Make it a requirement. I can give you a plethora of examples on how you're losing and wasting so much more money than the time it's going to take you to document your procedures and get your employees to use them. You're losing all that time and money because of the lack of documentation, because of the lack of procedures, the lack of training, the lack of good workflow, the lack of discipline. You're losing so much more than the half an hour a day that it may take someone to log into Touchstone and review what they're doing in Touchstone. It's the difference between development, strategy, and then just doing the work. So let's talk for a second here about public processes. Um, so those of you who have been on the sessions for a while, you've seen me reference public processes, but I just want to make a plug for this public process area and kind of explain how it's used again. What a public process is, is it's a process that's been defined or set as public. And the way we define that is it's a process that's company-wide information. It's a process that everybody needs to use. Everybody needs access to it. It's a company-wide requirement, policy, um, something all employees um, need to know, not only know how to do, but need to be able to reference. So that's different than a process that is the accountability of one person, two people, even a whole department. If it's the accountability of one whole department, one person, two person, people, then it should be on the job description for their positions, even multiple positions. So like the performance review process, it's this person's accountability, this one's, this one's, this one's. But it's not a public process because not everybody does performance reviews. These people don't do performance reviews. So think about those processes that you want to make public and make sure that they are company-wide information. If you just mark everything as public and just have this huge, massive public process list, it's um, you're losing the value because oftentimes when you make something the accountability of everyone, it's really the accountability of no one. So make sure you assign accountability for the appropriate processes, but if it is company-wide, then make it a public process. So if we go here to the four functions, I'm gonna go to running the business because Generally, some of the HR processes are actually good public processes. So things like um, the employee handbook, and you can see since it's got this little green check mark next to that, this has been put in the public folder. Safety or emergency processes, good public process. Time off and vacation requests, that's something everybody needs to use. So if I select this process, I just go and flip this flag that says process, make process public and available for all users. And then you can see back from the four key functions list, it's got this little P next to it. The reason these two look different is because the safety process has been completed. So it's somebody went and marked it as complete, which is this button right here, which turns the process title black. And then when I'm looking at it from the four functions, I just see the green check mark. 
as opposed to this one that hasn't been finished yet and it, it just shows up with the P. So as you're going through your processes and looking at them, decide what is public. This one, emergencies and injuries, I think this is probably a good public process. So what do you do if there's an emergency? So I just put that in the public folder as well. Um, sometimes your software processes like these down here, like CRM how-tos or quick, probably not QuickBooks because that's more just a, a finance thing. Um, but any of your software how-tos or like the trainings for your software, how to use your software, you can make those public. When you make something public, it just sits on the dashboard and it allows people to access it quickly, um, go to it, they know right where it is. Sometimes strategic processes can be good public processes, like um, the uh, vision for the company or your um, strategic target for the year. Depends on how open book management you are, but sometimes even budgets for the year and then the follow-up, um, like the tracking of those budgets key performance indicators. Managers need to go in and create those, but sometimes it's, you want your other employees to be able to see where are you financially. Time management, that's another good public process. So this is like comp company-wide, people are having issues with how they're spending their time and they need to be more efficient. Sometimes you'll have classes and workshops that you give, like in-service trainings, and then you can create a process and call it um, classes and workshops and then upload any information that was left for you around that like PowerPoints or manuals or booklets and then make that public. So now if we go back to the dashboard here you'll see even more public processes listed here. This public process area um, is company resources. That's another way to look at it. So things that um, all employees um, default to or they need to access at one point or another. It can be training information kind of company-wide like how to do better time management or any kind of classes you've given. Um, HR type things like we talked about like employee handbook, um, take, requesting a vacation. You can also put in HR documents in here like you know how to change your withholdings or how to change your address, these types of forms. Um, and then what this becomes is like a placeholder for the, those company-wide documents. And that allows your employees to be more self-sufficient with things. They're not going to people all the time saying, where's that form? Where's this? Where's that? They know that it's in touchstone. It becomes like an intranet where you, you know, have, again, these forms, documents, information that all employees need to have at one point or another. It also becomes a way to um, give them information. So like if you did do a strategic plan for the year or you had some upcoming um, uh, changes that were going to be made um, or you're posting information about um, the efficiency of certain departments, you can create processes for that and then have, inform have that in those processes for employees to access. Managers can also start to use this as um, a way to save themselves time. So if an employee comes to them and says, God, I need the employee handbook. I can't remember this policy or um, what, what happened in that class or I wasn't here or whatever. How do I request a vacation? The manager can then say, hey, it's all in the public, it's all in the public folder on the dashboard and touchstone. Just go find it there. If employees are having problems with things and I want to say to my employee, you know, this the way you're spending your time here is completely inefficient. Why don't you go and do time tracking for a week just so we can look at it together and assess what you need to be doing and not doing and how to make it more efficient. You can go to the time management process on the dashboard and fill out the time logs there for the next two weeks. When someone accesses a process like time management from the dashboard, it opens it in the control panel view. So here, like here's this work plan on daily planning. All I can do is see what's here. I can't go in and edit or change anything. I could download this daily planning worksheet. I could go here to this time log. So this is time tracking. And just like in the dashboard, I can 
track this. These fields are all live now, and I can track this information of these time logs. I can save this as week one. And when I save it, it saves this back to Touchstone. So this is what I mean about it working the same way as the control panel. These public processes can't be edited or changed here. They can just be viewed. But if there is information within them, like time off and vacation requests, since I'm logged in as me, Touchstone knows it's me, if I go here to the um, time off request form and I put my name in and I fill this information out, I'm checking these boxes, I'm giving the reasons. When I save this, it date and time stamps it and saves a copy of this back to Touchstone. Now my manager could go and run a report over here. I could email them and say, hey, I requested a vacation. I could tell them I requested a vacation, or they would just run a report every week and see everything that's in there. So they run the report, and then they see that I requested the vacation. Or they can view my time logs that they've asked me to fill out. If we go here back to the dashboard, um, this is another way managers can see the public processes. If I click Bill here, down here at the bottom, just like these processes up here that are on my job description and I've been using and completing, down here at the bottom, I see the public processes as well. So a manager could go right here into time management and then they can go and look in the completed folder and see things. So use this public process area for processes that are company-wide. There are things people need to have access to sometimes, but not all the time. Their um, training information, useful company resources that all employees at some point or another need to access. If you have public processes and you've been viewing it another way where you've just said, oh, I finished this process, let's make it public, and you've been doing that for every single one, you're going to see that right away because your public processes will be 50 processes long. I would suggest that you redo it at that point. So go to the process on the four key functions and un take it out of the public folder. So I'd go to communications here, I'd make, take it out of the public folder, then go link to job description and put it on the job descriptions for the people who are accountable for it. So don't, if it's not the accountability of everyone, take it out of the public folder and then go and choose, this is a quick way to do it, link to job description and choose the positions that it's really the accountability of. Choose them, strategic or tactical, hit link, and then you'll see it's been linked. Okay, any questions about that? No? So since we were talking about time management, I'm going to go here to guiding the business. And I'm just going to highlight a few processes here from the library that um, are, I think are great um, processes for managing employees and helping them make, be more efficient. So here's this one called time management. If you go to the general process library, you're going to see these processes, all these processes listed here. If you've had your Touchstone account a long time and you look at a process like time management and there's not a whole lot in it, like this doesn't have a ton in it, you might try and go and just edit the title of this and then go back and now you can go and download the process from the library again. Because we add things to processes occasionally. If you ever have a question about anything that's been added, you can always ask us to. So now I go down and download this process again. And then there it is again. See, there's a lot in this process now. So this is a time management process. Um, this is like Stephen Covey, Michael Gerber. It's you know just basic general protocol for good time management. And we put a lot of different tools and techniques and ideas in here for time management. One of the things that I think really helps the most, if you're a manager trying to make sure your employees are using their time efficient, efficiently, is having them do time logs. So there's all different kinds of work plans up here that can um, help with uh, 
just thinking about the different elements of time management, like eliminating interruptions. And there's a work plan on how to do the activity log or how to do daily planning. But down here, there's some example um, in the document tool. There's a, some example time logs. This one is just tried and true. It's like a, a great, uh, simple time log to use. And you can ask your employees to go in the dashboard and do it. I think that's the best way to do it. Having said that, you could print this and have it on a clipboard. So basically, the idea is all throughout the day, every you know five, ten minutes, half an hour at the most, they sit down and just jot down what they've done. If they sit down to do one action and it takes them an hour, well, then they don't have to track what they're doing next until that hour is over, except if they're interrupted. So jotting down the activities that they're doing and how long it's taking. This category um, field is for the type of work. This will allow you to see how disjointed their work is, if it is. So if they're doing some sales work, some bookkeeping work, some IT work, you're going to see it in this category. And that's one of the first signs to you that there's no uniformity of work, that they're frantically doing things in all different directions, which is um, very makes people inefficient. So what this does in the end is it tells shows you what they're doing. It shows you how long they're spending. It helps you eliminate interruptions or see the interruptions. And then it tells you what type of work they're doing. If, if an employee has done this for a week, say, every day for a week, you're going to get a pretty good taste of how they're spending their time and what are the, the issues that they're having. So once they've done the daily time log, then you look look for, um, first of all, ways to eliminate interruptions. So here's a work plan on that. It's just a step-by-step -step for how to eliminate interruptions. So you can go to these other um, topics in here when you've decided what are the key issues that the employee is having and then look for techniques on how to solve those. This is a uh, uh, this is an uploaded file, but it's a, a document that describes the cost of interruptions. It's enormous. So you can view that just if you need some or you need to show explain to the employee why that that's such in the end it can is, is such a time suck. Also this one prioritizing and planning tasks. This is a good one. I think I talked about this a few weeks ago where where you list out a task and you talk about a priority if you can delegate it. So with these library processes like this one, just start at the top and go through and read all this information, um, kind of get a, a handle on what's in it. Um, go to the next one, which is the daily activity log, and then it's going to reference the other tools that are inside of this process. If you need information, go and read like these different doc documents on the cost of interruption or the big hole in your day. And it, it gives like just general things that tend to happen when, uh, when people are going about their day and how to solve those things. And then consider doing some type of a time log, even if it's for, if it's for yourself or for your employees who are having problems. And then think about something like this. This is called a daily planner. All, I think a lot of us are, have our schedules on computers now, but you can mimic the same thing on your, um, on your Outlook calendar or CRM calendar you're using. So this helps you decide what are the high priority tasks for the day, phone calls you need to make, other tasks. Then you schedule in what you're doing from this time to this time. So appointments that you have are scheduled into your day. You keep free time in, bet in between appointments. And then you go through the high priority tasks and you plug them into the schedule. So you know at this day, at this time, once that time hits, you're gonna then do the high priority task. So spending five minutes in the morning planning out your day is a, a very useful time management thing to do for yourself and for your employees. So time management, that's the, a library process. Next week, we are going to be talking just about the dashboard. So I'm going to be discussing um, technically how to do use the control panel and management review. But most importantly, I'm going to be talking about how to use this as an effective management tool um, 
for training and for the implementation and the long-term success of processes. So if any of you are managers on the line or you have managers in your company who you want to be using Touchstone, you want to give them some context for it and some reasons why it's so important and to see the functionality within here and how it can support them, um, have them come to the um, next training session next week. Um, this, a manager's job is to manage processes. That's their primary accountability. If I can condense it down to one simple thing, a manager's job is to manage processes by which employees get results. And the control panel functionality here and management review specifically um, support a manager in that, in, in that endeavor. So thanks for coming, everybody, and I'll talk to you next week.